Yes, my name's Rebecca Milton. Um, I'm an occupational therapist and I work over at the Repat Hospital. Um, you've probably heard of OT in a different context to driving before. Um, we, are, we have quite a broad, a broad sort of scope. Um, sometimes you might see OTs in terms of home modifications or rehabilitation or equipment. I suppose the underpinning feature of all of that is function. And so that's where we come into driving, because obviously driving is about maximising function and independence as well. So that's why I've come along today to talk about driving um, and to talk about the impact perhaps of Parkinson's on driving. On this side? Yeah. Thanks. You can see. Yeah, I realised that halfway through. Sorry about that. <laughs> Um, so I'll talk about different strategies that you can, that we can perhaps um, suggest that you apply to elongate driving and also talk about how an OT might become involved if an assessment is required. Um, I'll also look, go through what that assessment might look like and at the end we'll have a chance for questions and to discuss any concerns that you might have. Um, if it's alright, I thought I might ask, are people in this room still driving? Yep. Yep. Great. Excellent. Has anybody actually had a driving assessment? No. 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 All right. Have you thought about it before? I've thought about what that might be, what it might look like. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I suppose if it's okay for me to say, it can seem like a really daunting process. Yeah. It needn't be. And I hope that by coming today, I can help you to feel a bit more comfortable about it and help you to know that really the main reason that we do assessments is to check what we can do to elongate your driving but also to make sure that the safety of you and your family and of course other road users is protected because I'm sure that that's what, what we all want over and above the capacity to drive is to keep everybody that we know and love safe. Yeah. So in saying that I think it's fair to say that you know, driving in our current society is really important and we absolutely understand and respect that. So certainly if, or if you do come to our driving clinic, you know, you, your, your identity and perhaps the way that that's wrapped up in driving is something that's well appreciated. Um, so we, we do try and help to assist you to continue driving for as long as possible. If I'm honest, I mean, I, you, this group and, and perhaps anybody else who might be watching perhaps um, down the track, you know the symptoms of Parkinson's so much better than I possibly could, so I'm hardly going to tell you um, what symptoms might um, arise, but I might sort of just let you know that the way that they manifest when you're driving, um, you know, that, that can look different for everybody. Perhaps the response times, processing time, accuracy of, of speed, of braking, um, the smoothness of accelerating, all these things can be affected by Parkinson's, as they can by any medical condition. And I suppose that's the thing that we need to keep in mind, that Parkinson's is a medical condition, like many others, and plenty of people drive with a medical condition. The trouble is, is that it just needs to be managed carefully to make sure that you are safe um, at all times. And so that there is that sort of threshold when we begin to look at, right, when is it not quite as safe as, as it ought to be? So things that can really help when you're driving um, are to reduce the demands. So perhaps choosing routes really carefully so that you can avoid adverse circumstances. Um, plan your times that you drive. Um, I realise that medications can help you to have periods that are slightly more um, um, active than others. So think about when you're going to be leaving home and, and think about how that responds um, in relation to your medication regime or just your energy levels. Um, and also I think that if we can look at routes or, or ways to get to locations that would be likely to have um, the least chance of risk, then that's a really important thing to do as well. When you're driving, um, I think one of the most important things that anybody with any kind of medical condition, or even just um, as we get older, as, as you get older, one of the best things that we can do is to keep a defensive driving strategy. So that is keeping a good distance between yourself and the car in front to allow for that extra processing time. It's, it's sort of an annoying irony, I suppose, insofar as when you, we get older, 
processing time takes longer, reaction time slow down. So you do need that extra time to register what's happening in the environment and to plan your response. The trouble is, is that our roads are getting busier and cars are getting faster and people are getting more hurried. So it's this, this, this annoying sort of dichotomy there where um, as, as, as perhaps you need a bit more time, the environment may not give you that. So it's up to you to implement um, a way to reduce the demands, reduce the strain, reduce the stress of driving, make it something that can be enjoyed, not something that needs to be hurried and become um, more, more anxiety provoking than it needs to be. Um, now, as I've mentioned here, um, there are lots of lots of there are lots of different kinds of equipment and little tools that can be used to, to help you to carry on driving. Um, maybe some of these won't be important for a while, um, but perhaps some of them might be nice to keep in mind. This is only a tiny, tiny um, uh, little example of the things that can be purchased. Um, the Independent Living Centre have lots of different things. Something that I think that um, perhaps I never really gave an awful lot of thought to until the recent years, I suppose, is just how useful blind spot mirrors can be. I suppose if there's one, one piece of equipment that you might like to invest in, um, mirrors that would save you taking your eyes off the road to check over your shoulder to check your blind spot, that's something that can be really useful. Um, when there's muscle rigidity or muscle stiffness, Moving your neck unnecessarily can be, can be distracting. Um, so if there's a way of reducing the necessity of moving your head and your eyes away from the road and what's in front of you by using blind spot mirrors or additional mirrors, then that's really useful. I think that the best thing that we can do is to be aware of our environment. So anything that you can do to maintain contact with what's happening around you and around your vehicle will keep you safer for longer. So if that means getting some special mirrors that can actually give you um, more, uh, more capacity to understand what's happening in your environment, because that will give you more capacity to respond to it safely. Um, I think if it's all right, I might just nip in front of the slide for a second. These blind spot mirrors, oopsies, sorry, I hope I haven't ruined your microphone. Um, but um, these blind spot mirrors are very common and they're very cheap. They can just be purchased from super cheap auto or places like that. Whereas these ones here, they, are, they give you far more vision um, and I think that they do need to be bought a bit more special um, from uh, more of a specialty type um, place or, or perhaps even on the internet. But just give some, some thought to those sorts of things. Other examples can be um, seat belt protectors, just in case there is any kind of involuntary movement, just because the edges of seat belts can be quite sharp. Of course, um, these little handy bars, I think they can be actually purchased from chemists, they just help to transfer in and out of the car. And swivel seats, um, so like a little cushion that actually swivels on itself to help with transfers. Um, but obviously these things are just um, to keep on standby and just for your own information. To be honest, the swivel seat, whilst great, um, a garbage bag on a, on a seat does equally as good a job. It just makes the seat slippery and helps you to slide in. Um, now, I might see if there's a problem with that, just let me know, but I'll just leave it there for now. Thanks. There, sorry, that one is actually a little step. This is um, the side of a car, and so this is a little step to help um, if, if actually getting into the car's an issue. Yeah, yeah, thanks for asking. <clears throat> so this, this next slide just talks about the role of your medical team. Now, it's really important that between you and your family members and people who love you and perhaps go along to uh, appointments, that your doctor is able to gain a realistic impression of your driving ability. And so that may at some times mean getting information from other people to see, because obviously a doctor can only gauge it based on how you present in their office. So sometimes doctors will seek the advice or opinions of, of your next of kin so that they can get an accurate idea of how safe you might be on the road. Um, so it is actually the doctor's obligation to let the Department of Transport um, know if your condition may impair your ability to drive. Equally, it's actually your responsibility also to make sure that the Department of Transport knows that there is a condition there that may impact on driving. Um, now, the driver, uh, the, the doctor, I apologise, 
may decide that an assessment is required and there are two options there. The Department of Transport offers assessments. Now these assessments are fairly brief, they go for 20 minutes or so um, and they don't necessarily look at the causes for any issues, they look at you or, or anybody who com comes along as any member of society. So they don't look at medical conditions, they don't look at anything beyond how you present that day. Um, now the other option of course is the occupational therapy driving um, assessing assessment and that's where I come in. Okay, so that assessment is um, a lot more um, thorough um, and we do, we do go through um, a whole range of, of things to make sure that we get a really good idea of how safe um, you may be on the road and if there's anything we can do to help to elongate that. Um, so just to let you know, um, I've been an OT for about 12 years now um, and to, to be a driver assessed um, a, a driver assessor, you do need to have a certain amount of time um, under your belt before you can do the course. Um, and so it is an additional course, it's an additional, as a postgraduate degree. Um, so this is just talking a little bit about what the driving assessment at the REPAT looks like. Um, as I mentioned before, I work at the REPAT, so the information I'll give you is specific to the REPAT, but I can't imagine it would vary hugely um, at other centres. Um, so the first thing we do is just to talk about driving, to talk about your background, um, and so we have an interview, just talk about when you got your licence and history of accidents, anything that you may have noticed, um, that might have slipped in recent times. Um, and then we have a few different assessments that we do in the office, and that goes for about an hour before we go out on the road. And the on-road assessment goes for one hour. So, um, uh, yes, the, let me just let you know, as I've said here too, that the on-road assessment happens in a dual control vehicle. So we have um, driving instructors who come along and they've got a separate set of brakes um, and they can give advice um, and, and some encouragement and some feedback as we go through the process on the road. <coughs> Um, so there are different places around, I will come back and explain a bit more about that in a second, but I just sort of let you know that there are different places that driving assessments can be conducted in Adelaide. Um, you can see them here and there are now um, a lot more private OTs also doing assessments. I think it's fair to say that um, whilst the waiting list at the REPAT um, is if, uh, look, to be honest, it's probably about between two and three months on average from referral to assessment. So it does seem like a long time. Um, but the assessment at the moment, um, currently, costs $90 at the REPAT, and that's purely to pay for the driving instructor's time. Um, so that's paid directly to the driving instructor. There's no cost from the REPAT's perspective. Private OTs obviously can get it done quicker, but it's a lot more expensive. So what happens at the REPAT is that basically you'll come along um, to our driving fitness assessment clinic. Now that's headed up by um, specialist doctors. So the doctors then discuss um, your driving, they discuss the concerns that have been raised to them, perhaps by the GP or perhaps another clinic that may have filtered through. Um, and then they'll look at different driving options for the future. And if there's any kind of uncertainty about someone's capacity to drive or their safety, then that's when they'll be referred to me. So it's kind of like a subsection. I hope that that makes sense. So you go through the doctor's clinic and then if they're not sure, to the OT. Um, and so after that, as I mentioned, we've got the pre-drive screen. Um, where we talk about your medical condition and how that may or may not impact on your driving. Um, and then depending on the referral that's come from the doctor, so the driving fitness clinic, there'll be a different focus that might be required for the assessment. So the, um, the, the different focuses um, might be physical, cognitive or vision or visual issues. But regardless of the, uh, the domain that's of most concern to the doctor, all of our clients that come through need to have their visual registration and their hazard awareness checked before we go on the road. So there are some standardised tests that we do to ensure that we can have a look at this properly before we get out into real life. Um, I thought that just it might be really useful for you to see some examples of this. So if it's all right, we'll do the next slide together if that's okay. So just looking at this slide, 
would, if you feel comfortable enough, it'd be great if people could um, join in. <laughs> um, so tell me, can you tell me the, the hazards? If you were traveling behind this blue car here, would you feel safe enough to just shout out any potential hazards that you'd be looking for? Exactly, yep, perfect. What else might you be worried about if you were driving behind the blue guy? Thank you, yes, um, um, uh, erratic stopping from this bloke, yep. Anything else? People opening their doors and parked cars. Exactly, yep, anything else? It might be tricky to see in this room, um, but there, there's an indicator on here, so you'd be worried about that white car pulling out. You'd also be thinking about the traffic lights here, making sure that they don't change quickly, and making sure that given that's a one-way street with these idiot pedestrians <laughs> everywhere, um, making sure that um, the cars don't pull out also in front of you. Yeah. Is it all right if we do one more? So in this slide, I'd like you, please, if you don't mind joining in, um, to tell me what all the different signs in this slide are telling you. Exactly, thank you. What else? <coughs> Perfect. What else? Just a curve just Excellent, great. Anything else? Bus stop. Yes, perfect. They're the only ones I mark, so anything else is a bonus, but that's perfect. Now tell me, if you were travelling in this lane here, what would you physically need to do in the car? What would you need to do immediately? Thank you. What else? Exactly. And there's one more thing. Indeed. One more, one more thing. You need to check your blind spot. Um, it's a legal requirement whenever you're changing lanes or merging with traffic that you check your blind spot. So if that means that you've got an extra mirror, fantastic. If not, it, you must do an over-the-shoulder check. Yep. So that's perfect. And then merge right when it's clear to do so. Now the next slide, um, this, is, this is an example of one of the tests that we do. The other test that we do is a series of 11 images that come up on the screen, but the images only stay on the screen for three seconds. So what we're testing in this instance is the capacity for you to look at some visual information, lay down a very, very quick memory, so encode it um, well enough to then do something about it. Obviously, if you're in the car, you need to be able to lay down a very quick memory um, to be able to hold on for in to information long enough to brake, to change lanes, to look in your rear vision mirror, these sorts of things. We can't test that um, ultimately in the office, but we do obviously go on the road. So this next little slide is looking at how well you go, looking at information just briefly, and then telling me about it when the screen goes black. So we're going to give it a go. Um, and it does, it's just for fun, really. So um, the image will come up on the screen for three seconds. What I'd like you to try and take in, don't tell me about the roundabout, don't really care about that, don't tell me about shadows or the trees, just tell me about the people, the bikes, the cars and that sort of thing. And your job is to tell me where it is, where the objects are and where they're going, so the direction that they're going in. So we'll pop it on. Okay, can anybody tell me what they saw? Whereabouts was it? Left or right? Mm -hmm. Yep, good. So there's a bike on the right going right. Perfect, thanks so much. Yep. Anything else? Anything else other people saw? Whereabouts? Yep. Yep, perfect. Good. Anything else? So we saw one pedestrian, one bike. Perfect, good. And there was one more thing. Did anybody pick it up? There was a car. There was also a car. And um, that was coming towards us. It was at the back right of the roundabout. Yeah. So it's a lot less scary in the office. <laughs> now, there you go. You can check your answer. <laughs> so, yep. Yeah. We've got the bike on the right going right, person in the centre going left, and that guy, girl going left as well. This is a bit of an, um, an older slide. In fact, ours are um, a lot less grainy and a lot easier to see. 
Uh, what we'd say is the bike is on the right, heading right. Maybe. Pardon? Maybe. Maybe. Well, yes, this is true. Yeah. But I guess the main thing is, is that we see, that you see it. Um, yeah, yeah. Thanks for that. Now, our on-road assessment um, looks at, the obs at your observation, it looks at planning and judgement, um, and you can see the other things that we look at. We do a set route um, normally that uh, takes about an hour around the repat and we stop for feedback. But sometimes, and this has happened um, recently, and I'm not, I'm, not, um, I'm not worried about doing this at all, if somebody perhaps lives nearby and they say, I only want to go to the shops, then we may well just assess how they go going from their home to the shops. It might be a two kilometre rate, a two kilometre distance. So we are in the business of maximising ability and capacity. Um, so we look at the specific requirements for driving. Um, uh, normally this means taking our set route so we can see how people go in low, medium and high density traffic. We get them to do some spooky stuff like do a U-turn on dual carriageways um, if it's required. That is, if the person's after an unconditional licence. But if there is that idea of, I only really want to drive locally, then perhaps we can just do a modified route, but then that would need to be reflected later on in the report to say, well, look, I saw Mrs Bloggs drive this particular route on this particular day she was safe. Um, we didn't do X, Y or Z, we did do X, Y and Z. And then it would be up to the doctor to make formal recommendations about the driving future of Mrs. Bloggs. What sort of modifications can you get on your license? Ah, great question. Um, I will talk about it soon. Yeah, thanks, Margie. Um, so, um, after we do uh, after we do do the on road assessment, um, we we do talk with the doctor, the specialist doctor who you went through the first time. So back to that driving fitness assessment clinic, and there are different conditions, um, and there are a few options that can be made when I say about decisions about driving. So we have a few options open to us. There's obviously keep driving with no changes to your license. There can be, um, we need to modify driving somewhat, so either lessons to upskill. Uh, to be honest, uh, driving laws change um, and, and the time between which somebody actually gains their licence and their, their, um, the years that have passed now since drive, uh, whilst they've been driving, a lot can change. Um, and a completely able-bodied person really can really do with an upskill at times as well. Um, so it's, that, that, that's something that I, I, quite enjoy, I quite think is um, valuable, definitely. We can have conditions made to a licence um, and of course, if, if required, if, if we deem it necessary, we can recommend that somebody stop driving for their own safety or for the safety of others too. So when I talk about conditions, these can include all kinds of things. It can be about the hours that somebody drives, so a condition of driving in daylight hours only, for instance. Um, we can have a condition about the distance of driving, so driving within five kilometres of home, which will mean that somebody can get to church, to the shops and to their exercise class, but not necessarily go to Marion, for instance. Um, we can talk about the equipment that might be, need to be used, so um, blind spot mirrors are mandatory or um, not perhaps in the case of somebody with Parkinson's but um, as I mentioned to Anne before, lots of people come through our clinic who have had strokes. Um, so spinner knobs, changes to the um, accelerator pedals, hand controls, all these kinds of things um, that can make driving possible and safe can become a condition on a licence. Um, um, additionally, accompanied by a navigator, so it must have a qualified um, supervising driver when driving five kilometres from home, for instance. These are just examples, so please don't think that these are um, a com comprehensive list. This is just um, uh, to, to mention a few. Um, and regular medical reviews. So, for instance, if somebody's medical condition might be likely to change, um, and we rather than just the regular GP monitoring, if there's a need to really mm -hmm. specify that we need to keep an eye on this, that can become a condition of drive, a condition on a licence as well. Yeah, does that, does that help? And, and as I say, please, um, if you, I see that some people have a pen and paper, it's great, please um, save questions to, to, to the end as well. So, um, I was hoping that we'd have a bit of a discussion at the end, but um, before, before I finish the, the structured talk, I'd really like to, to, to just reiterate that driving 
we understand is a complex task and there's so many, uh, there's so many facets to driving and to keeping safe whilst driving. Um, and also we do really appreciate that people, it's not only a source of um, transportation but it's a, often it's a recreational activity and it can be a real link to someone's identity um, and we appreciate that. Um, it is your obligation and, and, and your GP or your specialist obligation to contact the Department of Transport if your condition may impair your ability to drive. So it's not necessarily that um, as soon as you're diagnosed with Parkinson's that you need to tell the Department of Transport as such, but when there's even the slight chance that it might impact on your driving, then it's time to let the Department of Transport know. Um, I wanted to let you know that there are assessments that are performed by the Department of Transport just because it can be really confusing that there are two different kinds out there but that the OT assessment really is a much more thorough process and that's not to make it more scary, it's to make it less scary <laughs> um, to make sure that we really get to know you well and to see what we can do to facilitate driving. Um, and look, as I've mentioned in the last part as well, driving isn't necessarily black and white. There's a big grey area in the middle where we can find a middle ground so that if driving at the same calibre is no longer appropriate, maybe it can be stepped down um, and maybe gradually phased out. But there are alternatives, there are, there are ways of modifying the task as well. Yeah. Now, I'd really love to be able to take some questions if there's anything that people would like to ask. Um, now's a really good time, particularly given that we have a slightly smaller group. Is there anything that people would like to ask? Um, about <coughs> yeah. You've got Parkinson's, you really need to inform them or you don't, or wait on your specialist or your doctor to do it? Well, yeah, it's probably a good idea to talk about it with your doctor. As I mentioned, if Hmm. Having so a what if the doctor said you're okay, yep. but uh, do I still have to register with my would, to say that I've got that particular problem? If there's any chance that having Parkinson's might impede your ability at all, you're better safe than sorry, and I'd say yes. But so you said you really should inform me. Yeah, I think it, yeah. Is yeah. it is mandatory. Yeah. But, it, so but it if is it impairs... Yeah. Yeah, it's a funny thing because there is that in the um, fitness to drive guidelines. Yes, you do need to inform the Department of Transport when it's likely to impact. So, so I'd be saying yes. Yeah, yeah. No, you're quite right. Um, and those forms are a really good opportunity to do and it. If they decided to give you a test, you'd have to go for a test. That's true. Yeah, yeah. So the Department of Transport can request a test, and, and your doctor can also request a test. And that would be the same no, it's not a question of waiting for the doctor to make a decision on that. Normally, it's the doctor that would instigate the testing, the assessment. Yeah. yeah. But it's our obligation. Yes, yes, it is. They'll just keep it in their records. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So I can just add to that. What, what's happened with me? My, my doctor, well, most people require me to have a doctor's examination uh, once every year yep. on a driver's license. That examination is not a practical examination. No. Nope. Like that. That it's just a questionnaire for the doctor with about three pages. And he just took, the only practical test he does is eyesight because I'm required to wear glasses um, for driving and uh, they're the ones I've got on now. So he just does the normal eyesight test and the other is just ticking off various things. Um, part, of that, part of that has to do with Parkinson's and the remainder is in relation to other medical conditions. Okay. And that's all I do. No yeah. reason to send that questionnaire out. Yeah. Uh, once a year, not yep. later to renew all the problems, lots of things like that. As you send the questionnaire, it's a Yeah. I think if you're over 75, then yeah, that, that questionnaire is sent. Um, and when we say annual medical reviews in relation to being a condition on a licence, that, that normally just takes the, um, takes exactly that. Um, so it's basically going to the doctor and doing that questionnaire and the eye test and all that stuff. Yeah.
So if you were involved in cyber and uh, an accident or something, you still can you get it? Yeah, and that's why so it's important. It's, it's you're exactly right. Precisely right, yes, thank you. Yeah, because it can compl complicate. Yeah, it can complicate matters. I think it's a really good idea to let, to let the Department of Transport know, just in case there was a circumstance where you were in, involved in an accident, then there wouldn't be any kind of complications from an insurance point of view. Yeah, yeah. That's true. yeah. Yeah. Does that? They ought to, but the onus is actually on the GP and on the individual to let the Department of Transport know. So if you're not sure if the, your GP has, it's a good idea for you too. Yeah. Yeah. What impact does the drums that we take these have on our driving? Well, I suppose. You will know better than I do what the impact of the drugs that you take for Parkinson's has on your general self and on your general well-being. Um, as I've understood it, um, having not worked specifically in the area of Parkinson's before, so please forgive my ignorance in this, um, I'm more suited to general rehab and in driving, but I do understand that there are on and off periods. And so perhaps the periods in which you're, you're um, more fluidly um, mobile and perhaps slightly more um, alert, they're obviously the better times to be driving. Um, Sorry, I'm telling you things that you know, I'm sure. Um, but, but then the, the periods in which muscle rigidity may play a factor or there are more involuntary movements, those are obviously times where it would be less safe to be driving. Does that, is that, uh, yes, thank you. And would Well, I think that those tests would definitely be more suited to illegal substances or um, alcohol. Yeah, they may, I, I don't know that their tests would be um, broad enough to, to show such things. No, I doubt, I, I don't know, but I'd be surprised. Um, I suppose if it's all right for me to link it back to the question that came up earlier, and that is that when we're looking at the impact of Parkinson's on driving, we're also taking into account the impact of Parkinson's medications on driving. So um, if, for instance, you feel that Parkinson's is really well managed, but there is a slight chance that the, the medications that, that are required can actually impact on your function, then it's just as important to get in touch with the Department of Transport, um, I believe. Yeah. Where do you expect to be when you read that? Um, I'm not sure. I, um, I, um, the, there is apparently an enormous building being uh, established at Flinders um, and I expect I'm really lucky that my position's permanent, um, so hopefully not in the gutter, but hopefully <laughs> in a building somewhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But definitely it won't be dissolved as far as I'm aware. No. Yeah. Please. What I do do, um, it's really interesting. Sorry, Pete, may I call you Peter? Yeah, um, Peter, it's really interesting. Um, lots of people, by the time they come through the clinic, will say, I don't drive at night. And I'll say, OK. And thankfully, often we'll have a next of kin or a wife or a spouse, somebody there to say, yeah, that's true. They haven't driven at night for five years. And so that'll be fine. Um, occasionally, when there is the need to drive at night, I know it's not an accurate, perfectly accurate um, simulation, but I often will go into an underground car park um, they're dire um, in terms of crazy people coming in and out of parks, low lighting, um, you know, and so that can be a really good um, test and predictor, if I may use the term, rather than actually um, a, a definite correlation. Um, if I'm uncertain, then, then I will actually, yeah, Please don't take this as something that we do often because I can promise you it's not. But if I was really concerned and somebody had a definite need to be driving at night time, what we could do is um, our driving assessors, who are a great bunch of blokes, I might say, look, Darren, would you mind doing an assessment with Peter 
after hours, and not even assessment. Could you go for an hour drive? Sadly, that would be at your own cost. Um, and then can you report back to me on how we went? Um, our driving assessors, um, our um, driving instructors that, that we do the on-road part with, they're very well um, experienced in the area of driving with people who perhaps are a bit older or might have chal different challenges, particularly medical conditions that might impact on their driving. So if somebody was dead set about driving at night time and I didn't feel that our assessment during the day could give me an accurate picture of what that might look like, I might do that. I haven't done that before, but you've given me a good idea if it comes up. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Are there any other questions? Please, please, oh, that's great. Yeah. Probably too, that's fine. I should know the answer to this, but no? it's confused me. Yeah. Uh oh, I hope I know this answer. It's in relation to what they call slip lanes. Yeah. And we had the, a picture up there before. Yep. Of the dual carriageway, for example, the freeway. Yep. And you have uh, a road coming out onto the freeway. With, yep. With a dotted line. And the question relates to, relates to who gives way to who. May I use the whiteboard? Sorry? Can I use the whiteboard? No, that no, way no. I might be able to draw what. Or even, Peter, if you wanted to draw it. As, but if I can make sure that I interpret your question correctly, but so you're saying, and this is okay, yeah. so you're saying that um, particularly on the freeway, if we've got a lane, uh, say a Crafer's exit or a Sterling exit like that, and so that's coming in here, and we've got the dots coming here, and then we've got the road here, is that what you're saying? And so you're wondering who goes first, this guy or this guy? Yep, okay, so it's a tricky thing. Technically, these guys do have right of way because this lane is actually ending and so these guys need to wait. However, if we've got, hmm, sorry, I'm not doing this very well, am I? Um, yeah. Oh, if I do it up here, is that okay? <laughs> So if we've got two lanes that come together like this and we've got a slip lane that comes like that but then the lane just kind of stops and we've got no more lines and we've got a car here and a car here, because these lanes do not continue and because this guy is ahead, this guy gets right of way. So where those lanes stop, this person needs to wait. Where the lines dissolve, it's first in best dressed. In saying that, be careful because barely anybody knows the rule as you've pointed out. It's really a source of contention. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for that question. Uh, well, I've often seen it on the freeway particularly. It's dying. I know exactly what you mean. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I know. And and look I, I really feel like I used to live actually up at, um, in Woodside and the number of times that I'd be late for work because of accidents because of people coming on and off their um, the ramps it was huge. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I know, and then that's a real trick too, isn't it? Because you're looking that way, and then you know you might have people coming up behind you. Oh, it's terrible. Yeah. It's a really good reminder, isn't it, Rebecca, that over time we all lose track of some of the road rules. Absolutely, and, and they change all the time. And it might be a really good opportunity to identify where you might have a little bit of a knowledge gap that you need to go back and. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. There is um, little things. Um, people are constantly surprised during our assessments, like needing to indicate left to come off of a roundabout. So even if you're going straight on a roundabout, if you intend to leave the roundabout, it's ideal to pop your indicator on to show that you're getting off. Or even if you're um, turning, say, left at traffic lights, tell me if I need to draw this up to make it more clear. Um, but if, for instance, you're turning right, uh, turning left at traffic lights, um, and there are multiple lanes available to you, 
you're well able to come from your little left lane over into whichever lane you choose, um, rather than coming over into your lane, putting on your indicator and then hopping over. It's a lot safer to just go across there. Um, but that's not something that everybody realises either. And um, yeah, yeah. Uh, providing there's nobody coming, obviously, and if there's only one lane that's doing your left, yeah, yeah. So it doesn't work if there are multiple lanes. Yeah, don't do it then. Um, but as long as it's just, yeah, the one lane turning left, you have got the right to move over without putting on your indicator. Absolutely. It always is give way to your right. Um, without a doubt, that is definitely the safest thing to go by. But you're right, there are little anomalies to that, to that rule. Yeah, yeah. A bit like on, um, on roundabouts, you know, it's always give way to your right, but actually you need to give way to anybody who's on the roundabout. So there are these little discrepancies. And although we do lots of tests in the office um, to look at knowledge of giveaways. We do do a, a, a test that goes for about 10 minutes um, that has, uh, I think it's eight different scenarios of... Take your time, don't get up too quick. Yep. Right. Yep. That's right. Okay, there's a chair behind you. Thank you very much. There you go. Oh. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. A good example of how to get up off the floor. Thank yeah. you, Kevin. <laughs> very good. Yeah. Can't we just... No, I'll sit down this way that way. You're okay with that? Indeed. And that's probably something that really I've taken out of today. Well, I hope that we can clarify that insofar as, yes, it's your obligation to let the Department of Transport know that you have Parkinson's. It's also your doctor's responsibility to, to monitor it and also to be in touch with the Department of Transport. It's an individual's responsibility to be honest with their doctor about um, different issues that they might be having and also um, to the doctor's responsibility to get a really good idea of what might be required in terms of further um, assessments. Um, and following from that, it's good to know that there are the two pathways, Department of Transport test, which is sometimes used, or the occupational therapy assessment, which really digs it out, if you like. Um, and then it's good to know that from there, there are different ways that we can go. There isn't just drive or don't drive, that there, are, there is that area in the middle. So um, I'm sorry if it did seem a bit grey, but I hope that that kind of flow, flow chart, if you like. Of course, could, what people are worried about now is they report it to the motor vehicles and then they sort of scared they're going to stop the drive. But if we can go back to that point that Parkinson's is a medical condition, yeah. breaking your leg is a temporary medical condition. Driving with diabetes is a medical condition. Parkinson's is a very complex medical condition. 
it takes different forms and it affects people in different ways, cognitively, physically. You know so much better than I do how it affects people. But at the end of the day, it is a medical condition that shan't be discriminated against more so than any other. So, and the Department of Transport, yes, licensing lies with them ultimately, but they don't know you from Adam and they're relying on your medical team and on assessments that are sent in to them to make informed decisions. They may request clarification, they may, may request assessments and what have you, but purely having Parkinson's is no grounds for licence removal. So virtually you can sort of report it to motor vehicles, but your doctor might not do anything about it because you're okay. Exactly right, please, yes, understand that. Absolutely right. The flip and side, family please. Can request, like sometimes doctors are fairly lax with it. They say, no, nah, you're all right, mate, you'll keep going. Yes. And family, not quite so sure. Exactly. Families can request the referral yep. or privately get assessed Absolutely. for their own peace of mind too. I think it's just so lovely, and I think you brought it out really clearly, Rebecca, that their goal is to keep you driving as long as possible. Now that may mean modifying your licence or upskilling you, but how um, wonderful that is that you can rest assured then when you get in the car that you're safe and your family knows you're safe. It actually improves the quality of your driving experience to know that. And, I think and also your own peace of mind. I think your own peace of mind. There's nothing worse than hoping that you'll be okay when you get home, you know? Yeah. Can I just add another dimension here? And I think that is sometimes that the people who travel with you are sometimes good judges of how your driving is. So in terms of looking at your ongoing capacity to drive safely, um, I would encourage people to listen to family members if they're expressing any concerns about your driving. Because sometimes with Parkinson's, the brain feedback is what can be faulty. So you can think that you're going along beautifully and driving very safely, um, and your relative can be very anxious driving with you because they're seeing that maybe you're not judging the distances accurately or that you're not responding quickly um, where there might be a person walking out of the road. So that they sometimes can judge those changes in your driving which are more difficult for you to see for yourself. Indeed. And so that's another bit of information for you to be gathering if you're looking at assessing, you know, am I in a, in a position to still keep driving safely? Sure. So definitely, um, Consider those things as part of the whole story. Pardon? Oh, all serious. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. oh, good. That's, right. That's great. So That's great, Peter. The, driving is such a complex thing. It sure is. And, and it has to interface with Parkinson's, which is also a very, very complex thing in terms of the range of symptoms, the effects of medications and so on. Um, so it's, it's being respectful of that, that complexity, I think. Um, and also those aspects around level of insight mm. that might be changing around those that safety. Sure. Thanks, Anne. From the car insurance perspective, should we be letting insurance people know that we now have I think of some sort? That's not a nice word, but yes, it probably is a good idea to let your insurance company know. Yeah, often I, I would I would assume that that might be part of their questions um, anyway uh, on the forms that they send. Yeah. Uh, uh, we've just done travel insurance. Uh, they asked us if, um, if this is a pre-existing condition. Uh, then they sent a form out, and it's a bit like uh, what Peter was saying. Um, basically, it just asked them whether uh, there was any effect of drugs, yep. um, whether there was anything you can't do, whether you need AIDS, um, and everything was no, 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 no. Yep. And they came back and there was no restrictions. Perfect. On travel insurance. So I guess, you know, it's all a matter of how that assessment is done, whether it's done on paper or physically. Indeed. Exactly. And I think the thing that invalidates an insurance form is when you answer incorrectly. Yeah, so inaccurately. you're up front and yes. you're honest with the boxes you tick yes. uh, and clear about what your capacity is, you're fine. But I think if you think, oh, no, I'm not going to do that because yes. that then that's when you're going to invalidate yeah. any insurance. Yeah. And I think then that you do that with the view that um, if there is some um, challenge, to your keeping your licence or whatever, that you say, 
um, well, I'm happy to go for an assessment. Mm -hmm. And that's where the more, more specific the assessment can be, as is offered through the recap, for example, the better it's going to be in building a case for you to be able to continue to drive. Mm -hmm. Pat, I'm a bit worried when you said before about um, the grey areas and I'm worried that I might have accidentally not been clear enough about the responsibilities of the individual. Uh, Do you feel that it's been clarified well enough yes, now? Well Great. People, um, people don't necessarily know the steps sure. or recognise them or have had that shared. The other thing is that I think it's still a little bit of a grey area about um, accurate diagnosis. Like, you know, specialists might say, look, I think you are uh, early onset, but there's no definitive. So I think that's the grey area that I'm, that I'm referring sure. to. So sure. it's more about when do you really know, and it's more probably now um, about ability um, sure. and those sort of things that are making an impact. So I think that's the, that's the problem, you know. This blood test, the sooner that it comes, the better, so that people, um, so that doctors and yeah. specialists can give a more accurate uh, description. Because in that, <coughs> excuse me, in that time frame, there is that time where people don't know. Yeah, absolutely. That is what they've got. I know that there's more to it than I can possibly understand, and that the emotion behind it yeah. um, would. Uh, perhaps impact the way you make decisions, but I suppose from an objective point of view, if you're uncertain at all, I believe that it's the safest thing to do is to inform the, motor, the Department of Transport. Um, but I understand that to do that can be bigger than it is on the surface in terms of acknowledging that there's something wrong and all that sort of stuff. So I'm not going to pretend to understand that, but I do think that if if there's anything that might impact on driving now or in a few months, that it's a good idea to let the Department of Transport know. Yeah. Can I just ask you, how the Department of Transport registration people, if one uses your offices, do you, do you relate to them? Yeah, so we ask that um, you sign a consent form. Um, the report that I write, I um, cannot make any formal recommendations at all. What I offer is, an, um, I don't want to say expert, but a specialised opinion based on the way that somebody performs in the tests that I do. That report goes to the doctor and it goes to the Department of Transport and they just keep it on file. The doctor is the one who then writes the letter that is the... Um, I don't want to say the deciding letter, but I suppose it is. They write the letter that ultimately can invoke changes on a licence or, um, or, or request cessation or continuation of driving. Right, so the responsibility rests with the doctor? Yes, it does.